Uh, sorry, the Jenkins talk was full and you had to come here. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm David Danzilio, and I'm going to be talking about uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, I pretty much just threw Princess Leia in there to get the talk accepted. So, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but there we'll talk a little bit about Princess Leia. So, um, about me, uh, I'm David. Uh, I run the cloud and platform automation team at Kavaris. We're a uh, boutique consulting firm based in the Bay Area. Um, I was previously at Constant Contact, which I see a lot of my Constant Contact friends in the room. Uh, I'm feeling a lot less nervous because like 50% of the people in the room are friends. So <laughs> um, I don't know why I thought it would be a great idea to come on stage and talk about my insecurities. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I was, I'm an open source contributor to a number of projects, and uh, mostly in the Puppet ecosystem. So. Uh, one of the things I want to start out with saying, uh, I am not a psychologist. Uh, I'm just a guy who knows how to Google. Uh, and yes, I do appreciate the irony of uh, opening a talk about imposter syndrome with the spiel about how unqualified I am to talk about it. So <laughs> um, so here, here's where we get to uh, Princess Leia, actually Carrie Fisher. But um, why am I here? I figured uh, I'm here because Princess Leia told me to. Um, I put the talk proposal together uh, after listening to Terry Gross interview Carrie Fisher on Fresh Air. Um, and Carrie was talking about her uh, struggle with addiction. Uh, and she said something that really struck a chord with me. It was, it, it creates community when you talk about private things. I felt very lonely with some of the issues that I had or the history that I had. Uh, and when I shared about it, I found that others had it too. So I'm here to add my experience to the conversation uh, in the hopes that it'll help others feel a sense of community. So. Imposter syndrome. Uh, the scientific literature doesn't really acknowledge imposter syndrome. Instead, it talks about something called the imposter phenomenon. Uh, and, and studies suggest that upwards of 70% of the population will experience the imposter phenomenon at some point in their life. Uh, I take imposter syndrome, sort of the pop psychology uh, term imposter syndrome, to mean people who experience it uh, constantly. Okay. Um, the imposter syndrome, uh, or the imposter phenomenon was first uh, described by Dr. Pauline Rose Clance in the uh, journal Psychotherapy in 1978. And I, I highly recommend people take a look at uh, some of the journal articles on it. It's only about 50 pages, um, and there's a lot of really good stuff in there if you're interested in uh, learning more about the imposter phenomenon. Uh, I've included a bibliography at the end of the presentation if you want to read more. Uh, Clance focused her research on high-achieving women, uh, and it initially focused on women because at the time, uh, they had just started to make up a significant portion of the professional workforce. But further studies have shown that men and women experience the imposter phenomenon at the same rate. And so uh, the literature talks about how women and men experience the imposter phenomenon differently. Uh, men are less likely to admit their feelings than women, but in anonymous settings, men and women experience the imposter phenomenon at the same rate. Uh, and the literature talks about uh, societal influences on men and women uh, with regards to how they cope with imposter syndrome. For example, men with imposter syndrome uh, tend to push themselves and take more risks in order to prove their competency, while women tend to uh, withdraw and take fewer risks in order to preserve others' perceptions. Uh, imposter syndrome is really all about perception management. So uh, I thought there were some, some interesting, um, interesting topics with regards to how men and women handle these things. But um, So how many people here have heard of imposter syndrome before this talk by a show of hands? Yeah, I mean, everybody, right? Basically. Um, most of us know what it is, um, but I wanted to take some time to talk about it. and. Um, specifically what it kind of feels like to experience imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome makes you feel like you're unqualified for the position that you've been put in. It makes you feel like some mistake has been made. Like you're standing on a stage in front of people talking about something that you have no <laughs> qualifications to do. So. Um, a professor said that I, I'm not good enough to be on the faculty here. Some mistake has been made in the selection process. This is a woman who went through the rigorous hiring process uh, of a university, a research institution. Uh, a university department chair. Obviously, I'm in this position because my abilities have been overestimated. 
Um, I, yeah, that's astounding to me. And, and part of that, what we'll talk about is that it, it is astounding, right? It's, it doesn't, it kind of defies logic. Imposter syndrome makes you feel like uh, you have to hide a part of yourself. You have to keep up appearances in order to uh, conceal the fact that you're a fraud. And, and that can be exhausting. A doctoral student said that, uh, I was convinced that I would be discovered as a phony when I took my comprehensive doctoral examination. I thought the, test had the final test had come, in one and in one way, uh, I was somewhat relieved at this prospect because the pretense would finally be over. I was shocked when my chairman told me that my answers were excellent and that my paper was one of the best he'd seen in his entire career. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful. Another uh, PhD candidate said, although my grades were fine and I was there on a scholarship, I was sure that my colleagues, professors, department, and university would find out that they had made a mistake, that they shouldn't have admitted me to grad school, that they shouldn't have given me a scholarship. This woman went on to talk about how uh, she was convinced that a mistake had been made in her, by her undergraduate institution and that they were going to uh, revoke her bachelor's degree. So. Imposter syndrome makes you feel like you have nothing of value to add to the conversation. It makes you afraid to speak up. Um, if you've seen HBO's Insecure, it's a fantastic show, and Issa Rae has talked a lot about um, her struggle with imposter syndrome. She had to psych herself out uh, just to convince herself that she was worthy enough to tell the stories. The imposter cycle um, is sort of the thought process that somebody with imposter syndrome goes through. So uh, <laughs> as I was writing my slides uh, last night and this morning, uh, I was going through this thinking, wow, this fits me to a T. So you're uh, given a task um, which triggers anxiety, self-doubt, and worry, and you respond in one of two ways, either over-preparation or procrastination. Um, in my case, it was both. <laughs> um, my house is really clean, though, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, but regardless, you get, the, you get the task done, right? And you have that feeling of relief. Um, somebody will give you positive feedback, but based on how you accomplish the task, uh, you're gonna, you discount that feedback. If you overprepared, it's because you put in a Herculean effort to get it done. Uh, or if you procrastinated, it was just luck. And so that discounting of your positive feedback feeds back into the loop where you know, you're continued to perceive yourself as a fraud, it increases your self-doubt, depression, anxiety, and then it starts all over again. So who are the imposters, right? Um, imposters have high expectations uh, for, their own, uh, for their goals and have their own concept uh, of ideal success. Imposters disregard their successes if there's any gap between the actual performance and their ideal standard. Imposters are high achievers who also make unreasonably low assessments of their performance. Uh, and some people are more prone to imposter syndrome than others. If you're familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect, it's kind of the opposite of it, right? And actually, Dunning and Kruger found that uh, people who are more capable consistently underestimate their capabilities. Introverts, all right, studies have consistently shown that introverts are more likely to experience imposter syndrome. Um, introverts tend to keep important aspects of their personality hidden from the world, uh, and that separation can make you feel like you're not seen for who you really are, which is a central component of imposter syndrome. I am an ambivert, so I'm about 50% introvert, 50% extrovert, so I kind of get some of that. <laughs> uh, imposter syndrome affects high performers. So if you're feeling like an imposter, you're probably just not. This may actually be because of the imposter syndrome itself. And I know for me, fear of being seen as an imposter has motivated a lot of my own hard work, which in turn has resulted in success. Uh, the key here is to understand your motivations. Uh, achievement in knowledge work can be hard to measure. There, there's a uh, abstract disconnect between work and success, uh, preventing sort of that high fidelity feedback loop. Um, 
some research has shown that uh, imposter syndrome hits minority groups harder as a lack of representation can make minorities feel like outsiders. Um, and discrimination creates even more stress and anxiety when coupled with imposterism. Just a, another reason why representation matters. So are you an imposter? It's probably not. Um, I mean, really, if you think about it, just in terms of Occam's razor, is it more likely that you've managed to successfully defraud everybody in your professional life or <laughs> that you're just qualified? <laughs> I definitely am, though. <laughs> so there are a number of different approaches to coping with imposter syndrome. I'm going to talk about some of these strategies in general, and then I'll go into a little bit more of a narrative about my experience. So uh, imposter syndrome is a cognitive bias, and one way to combat cognitive bias is awareness. Once you're aware of your biases, you're able to recognize them when you're falling victim to them uh, and can work to counteract them. Uh, this, is, this is mindfulness. Becoming aware of uh, the superstitious and magical aspects of your own imposter beliefs allows you to consciously combat those behaviors and reinforce th uh, that reinforce those beliefs. Knowledge is power. Imposter syndrome can leave you feeling helpless. And one way to combat that is to spend time understanding how imposter syndrome works and affects you. Acquiring knowledge on a subject with which you're unfamiliar can make you feel like you're in control. Uh, and feeling empowered is very important when dealing with something like imposter syndrome. You're not alone. Um, everybody feels like an imposter at some point. Um, just know that. And, and talk about it. Uh, talking about your imposter syndrome will help others realize, or uh, talking about your imposter syndrome with others will help you realize that you're not the only one who feels this way. Um, you'll start to feel less of an outsider, and you'll help others feel better in the process. Sharing your experience with imposter syndrome helps others see the absurdity of the imposter phenomenon. By seeing someone successful, share their feelings about imposterism, they'll be able to recognize the absurdity in, um, in their thinking. Embrace it. Turn it around. Imposter syndrome can be a powerful motivator, uh, but it can also be a powerful demotivator. Mindfulness is important uh, for recognizing when imposter syndrome is holding you back. Uh, I suggest you embrace your imposter syndrome and harness its power. Uh, when you realize that imposter syndrome is preventing you from doing something, make a conscious effort to step outside of your comfort zone. Uh, this isn't easy, and it's never going to be, but your imposter syndrome probably won't go away completely, so you'll need to learn how to work around it. Embrace being a novice. Um, entering a new field or embarking on a new professional journey can make imposters feel especially uncomfortable. I'm currently experiencing this as I begin my journey as a new manager. Recognize the benefits of being a novice. When you're steeped in the conventional wisdom of a profession, you can ask questions that haven't been asked before or approach problems in ways that haven't been thought of. In order to do this, you have to get comfortable with speaking up, uh, which is something that's very hard for someone with imposter syndrome to do. Uh, watch for burnout. Imposter syndrome can result in overwork. People uh, experiencing imposter syndrome tend to cope by uh, putting in extra effort, and this can quickly result in burnout if not tempered. So be mindful of your work habits and motivators. Hard work is a valid path to success, but because imposters have a skewed definition of success, it may, they may end up working themselves into the ground. This is also important for managers to know uh, about people on their team. So uh, linking this back to open source, I wanted to talk about my struggle with imposter syndrome. So as a kid, I was always a tinkerer. Uh, my parents loved to tell stories about me taking my toys apart to figure out how they worked. Uh, one day, my dad brought home a Mac LC, and I fell in love with it. It was one of the pizza box ones. It was, it was beautiful. Um, I was shy, nerdy, and bookish. Surprise, surprise. Um, I was never really a stellar student in school, but I was especially bad at math. And my dad is an engineer, 
Um, so he was always really good at math, and he never understood why uh, I had such a hard time with it. Um, I never really took any advanced math classes because I was afraid of being seen as, as stupid. And uh, this carried into college. I ended up going to school for political science, even though I was really more interested in becoming a software developer than a political scientist. Uh, but I was afraid of the math and, you know, afraid of looking stupid. So um, I ended up taking a job as a system administrator at my university. I worked there through grad school where I studied business. Again, not computer science. Um, but this is really where my imposter syndrome took off. Um, I was self-taught and I always felt like I was kind of faking it, never really making it. Um, I always compared myself to those Linux gurus who could tune the uh, kernel from memory, usually had really big neck beards. <laughs> uh, and even to this day, I still kind of feel uh, a little bit of a Linux novice, even though I know I'm probably more of an expert. Uh, this comes out most often in job interviews, uh, when I'm asked some esoteric question about the kernel API or something that nobody ever really needs to know from memory. Um, as I became more comfortable with system administration, the DevOps movement started, uh, and I was suddenly confronted with a whole new way to approach problems. So I started to teach myself how to code, which was really what I wanted to do anyway. Uh, I started with Python, ended up moving into Ruby. I wrote a lot of code, but I was afraid to share it with people. Um, uh, I had this haunting feeling that there were some very obvious problems with my code that uh, would be spotted immediately and I'd be out as a fraud. So I never really got much feedback and we all know that feedback is key to learning, right? So um, I went on with that for a little while. I was you know, an okay coder. Um, and then I heard the term imposter syndrome. I was at Puppet Conf um, and I had read an uh, interview with Luke Kinise, who was the CEO of Puppet at the time. He described exactly what I, what I was feeling and, and gave it a name, imposter syndrome. It was like a blindfold had kind of lifted. It gave me something to Google, something to research. Reading about imposter syndrome uh, helped me understand my own thought process and how to counter it. So what does this have to do with open source? <laughs> um, contributing to open source forced me out of my comfort zone. Um, it's really kind of key to how I became uh, and became more confident and, and better at being a software developer. I recognized my imposter syndrome was holding me back, so I decided to do something that made me very uncomfortable. I decided to write code and put it on the internet for everybody to see, and I, I expected people to tear me apart. I expected Linus Torvald's level of criticism, right? Um, I remember my heart pounding the first time I submitted a pull request on GitHub. I was sitting in my office at Sandia. Um, it, it was unreal. I still, I still f remember every moment of it. Um, I remember refreshing the page constantly, waiting for someone to chime in and tear me to shreds. Um, I don't think I got any more work done that day. I just was waiting for the ball to drop. Um, but the next day, I came into work uh, to a comment saying, thanks, this is great, and an unceremoniously merged pull request. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, I talked about, you know, uh, unreasonably high expectations. I realized, you know, I'm a perfectionist, um, and that's just how it is. The first PR was a small change, but I spent hours on it. You know, I obsessed over it. I, I wanted to make sure everything was absolutely perfect before I sent it out into the world. Um, I recognize today that I tend to put a lot of work into things like that, and so I definitely cope with imposter syndrome by putting in a lot of effort. And uh, one of the, you know, one of the key elements of imposter syndrome is a skewed standard of performance. And I'm a perfectionist. I had to learn to accept different levels of performance in order to stay sane, um, especially in the agile world of software development. Uh, the search for perfection can keep you from making progress. So. Uh, that's something that I had to had to deal with. Uh, I joined a supportive open source community. Um, after that PR was merged, the, the next one was much easier. I started to realize that the code changes I was proposing weren't just solving my own esoteric problems. And I realized that what I had to say was valuable. So I built up momentum. Uh, I started getting more involved in the Puppet community. I became a maintainer of a number of Puppet projects. 
I even published a number of my own modules, started a blog, spoke at conferences, began teaching people about Puppet. Um, and I built up a lot of confidence through this process and ultimately I became a much better software developer because of my involvement in the Puppet community. And I never did receive any Torvalds level of criticism. So. Uh, so I'm standing up here right now telling you about my experience so you'll be able to see uh, that you're not alone, that, um, but it's also so I can hear from you. So uh, the struggle continues. I still feel like an imposter on a regular basis. I, I struggled with my imposter syndrome quite a bit writing this talk. Uh, but I've learned how to fight my imposter demons, and hopefully this talk will uh, help you do the same. So that's it. Hi. Hi. Um, you talk in the talk about uh, how we han can handle feeling the imposter phenomenon ourselves. And you mentioned briefly how openness about it and uh, watching for burnout can help others. Are there other thoughts along those lines that you've had? Yeah, um, I mean, familiarize yourself with the people you're working with. Um, I, I think really the only way uh, to overcome uh, imposter syndrome in a meaningful way is to talk about it. And so um, being able to monitor your peers, uh, you know, talk, if you talk to them about it, uh, they're going to talk to you about it. I guarantee that they have some imposter feelings. And so uh, you can kind of crowdsource the effort that way. Just, it's really is as simple as just starting the conversation. So. Hi. Um, it's interesting to hear what you're saying because what DevOps is is something that I've been doing instinctively for decades. And it's in some ways kind of nice to have a name for it. But uh, I, I'm wondering if there's a lot of people in the DevOps world who feel like an imposter because what this world is is a lot of common sense that they've accrued over, over time. Um, so there's that aspect of it. The other aspect of it that makes me feel somewhat uncomfortable is all the tools that are necessary to be used in, in an effective DevOps world is overwhelming, almost mind-boggling. Um, and so there's this sense of, I know what to do. I just don't know the ins and outs of all the gory details of all the tools. So uh, I guess I'm making more of a statement as opposed to a question, but I'm really curious to know if other people feel that way and how they might deal with this glut of tools that they need to become an expert on. Uh, yeah, it would make a good open spaces talk. I have definitely felt that. Um, you know, I understand patterns, right? I know Puppet, but I don't know Chef, right? Does that mean I can't learn Chef pretty quickly? Because I know the configuration management patterns, you know? There, uh, it comes out a lot in job interviews. It comes out a lot in picking up new tools. Um, and for me, I, when, I, when I interview people, I make sure to look at the, at the patterns or look at the, the interface, not the implementation, right? Um, I don't care if you know a specific tool, uh, as long as you can, you know how to learn it, or you know uh, sort of the the patterns it deals with, right? So it's it's a, an attitude that we need to change. We for um, you know lack of a less vulgar way to say it, we need to stop like measuring each other's cojones uh, by what tools we accumulate in our heads. You know, um, it's that's not real learning. That's rote memorization but it can contribute to imposter feelings quite a bit, yeah. Uh, so I have one question on something you highlighted. Um, I think this talk, definitely relevant for a lot of people, so thank you for sharing. Um, was on the management piece, where you talked that managers need to be um, aware. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestions or um, examples? What happens if you become aware, but and how do, we, how do you approach? What's the next action step? as a manager who wants to you know, um, help uh, their employees like, overcome this? Like, well, yeah. Do you address it directly, or I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. I mean, obviously, uh, it depends on who you're dealing with, but I think that um, creating a, a place that's safe to talk about it, right? uh, ensuring um, a, a comfortable, uh, that you have 
an opportunity and, and lead by example. Uh, talk about your own imposter syndrome. Uh, the best managers are, are vulnerable, right? And if you talk about your own fears, um, that's gonna lower the bar for your team to uh, open up to you, right? Um, things like understanding how imposter syndrome affects things like burnout, right? That's a, that's a hard skill, that's knowing what the symptoms are, right? But also um, providing your team a, a safe place to talk about these things, I think is probably the most important, most important thing. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, sort of unreasonable expectations. I was wondering if you've seen anything in the, the literature that you've read or in your own experience about how those expectations are applied to other people. Um, do you have the same sort of level of unreasonable expectations for everyone around you? Or is it just for you? Yeah, so um, Dunning-Kruger talks more about your expectations of other people. Um, but I think that if you look at it, the expectations of the people around you with imposter syndrome is that um, they are more capable than you are, right? Um, so you're, if, by setting the bar especially high for yourself, uh, imagine what the bar you're setting for other people is. I've had to learn um, how to accept different levels of success, especially as a manager. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, Dunning-Kruger talks more about how you see others, whereas imposter phenomenon talks more about how you see yourself. But yeah, it's they're definitely linked. I think that's it. Yeah. That's it. Cool. Thank you so cool. much. It was an awesome talk. And thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.